All right, here we go. Finnegan's Wake Action Hour. It's been a while. Hello to anyone who's already here. Oh, I should probably put the chat in. Anyways, it's been a while. Yeah, I have uh, different reasons. Uh, I'm going to apologize right off the top because the sound may not be the best here because I'm pretty close to a train station, but whatever. I just wanted to get going with these again. I finally have a little material to cover and to update you all with on my progress in Finnegan's Wake. I've mainly been reading, finishing a shorter Finnegan's Wake by that Anthony Burgess edited book. I'm about, I'm almost like 20 pages left and I'm done. And then um, I've been reading the letters of James Joyce. So that's the train. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but if it, hopefully it's not too intrusive. I'll just try and talk over it, but it's not the end of the world. I think we can, we can deal with it. Uh, but let me know if there are any sound problems right now, if you can all hear me okay. If the volume is too low, I can turn up the gain. If it's too loud, I can turn down the gain. What have you. But, um, yeah, so uh, tonight, I think, tonight, uh, it's morning actually here. I'm in Japan still. And uh, I know this may not be the most convenient hour for Europe, but hopefully for the United States, it's working okay. We'll see if anyone shows up, but um, yeah, so let's kind of dive in. I guess I want to begin with, man, looking at the photo, <laughs> the video, my arms look so thin from the wintry weather here. I need to put some weight back on, but anyways, um, yeah, tonight I, I wanted to begin, let me look at my notes. I have some, I've, I've made some really interesting discoveries reading the letters of James Joyce, kind of changed my ideas about a few things I had about both Finnegan's Wake and Joyce's knowledge and so on. So I think this may not be the longest, I don't know how long this is going to run, but uh, I've been drinking coffee <laughs> in Japan, more coffee than I've drank the rest of my life combined probably. And I just drank a cup, so maybe it'll give me some energy to wrap prosaic as I talk about the letters of James Joyce, but I wanted to begin by thanking, uh, I don't know if they want to be named, so I'll just leave them nameless, but uh, two two of you guys have provided me with books or uh, PDFs of things that I was very interested in, so I, I want to thank you both. Uh, one of you provided me with that ultra rare book, The Underst it's called Understanding Finnegan's Wake, which I have yet to read, but I will read it probably this year sometime. And then the other person provided me with that PDF that I think I shared with you guys and put on archive.org of that website with with a lot of great annotations on, on Finnegan's Wake. So yeah, thank you. You know who you are and uh, I appreciate it. I don't, I don't make a lot of money on these videos, but I make, I get paid in books, which is in some ways more valuable. It's ultra rare books. <clears throat> so, uh, let me look at my notes. I'm seeing that I kind of wanted to just address how looking at this peripheral material, like his letters, which uh, they're not, they're not, they're not polished the way that his other prose is, and they can be repetitive and so on and so on. But there's, they really do shed light on what is, you know, canon with James Joyce or any writer and uh, the letters, not just the letters, but also things like Stephen Hero, which is the earlier version of a portrait of the artist as a young man that Joyce tried to burn and supposedly Nora Barnacle saved from the fire. Uh, speaking of like kind of incidental material, I just heard uh, this, this news came out like four months ago or something, but I just heard about it that the Huntington library in California, which, if you're ever in California, Southern California, you should go because it's an amazing, uh, just a beautiful gardens, huge park areas that a lot of people have weddings there because it's just so beautiful. Uh, cactus gardens. They have tons of paintings, a, a museum, but they also have a lot of rare manuscripts. And I heard that they just acquired for an undisclosed amount of money uh, this vast archive of Thomas Pynchon's work. And if you've seen some of my other videos, you know that Thomas Pynchon is probably up there with Joyce among my favorite writers. And 
Yeah, so I, I, I'm looking forward to see, hopefully they'll have some kind of exhibit. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to access that archive, but I think you have to be more of a scholar than I am. But who knows, maybe my, my, uh, my James Joyce credentials online will allow me to one day visit the Huntington again and access the Pynchon archive. Supposedly it's like 70 boxes of material and uh, that he, he, you know, this, this is stuff that he kind of accumulated and sold uh, via his wife and agent, I believe, I can't remember her name, Melinda Jackson, I want to say. And uh, I, I get the impression that Pynchon's kind of mainly, I don't know, wrapping up his, his writing career and his life. Like the, also the attempt, uh, or not the attempt, but selling uh, Inherent Vice as to, to Hollywood so that they can make that movie. I think that was just a, this, these are both ways that he can really amass as much money as possible from his, his writings. And I'm not, I'm not throwing shade on that or whatever the term is. Uh, I, I think it's great that he's able to cash in however he can. So anyways, I did, I'm just mentioning that cause we have a lot of Joyce's letters. Um, so, uh, interesting thing in the letters that I, that I've been seeing is that he'll jump between languages sometimes French. Some of them are written in French, some of them in Italian, uh, even German, which I don't think he was was his best language. Also a little Norwegian, the letter to uh, Ibsen. And apparently he can speak some Greek, which surprised me. Um, I'm going to address that when I look at the that specific letter where, where he talks about what languages he can speak and how well. Uh, who knows how well, though? You know, he, a person can say they speak it, but who knows? We don't, ha- we don't have actual letters written entirely in Greek. But a lot of fascinating name dropping in the letters. Uh, Hemingway shows up, Marcel Proust, Ezra Pound, William Butler Yeats, and so on. A lot of interesting people. <laughs> when he when he writes his letters to Pound, Ezra Pound, he'll begin them. He doesn't say "Dear Mr. Pound" or "Dear Ezra" or something. He just says "Dear Pound," which I find kind of funny. And uh, Ford Maddox Ford is going to be showing up because he has this journal, the Transatlantic Atlantic Review, which I think is the first spot that Finnegan's Wake. The excerpt or the, you know, the early versions of sections of Finnegan's Wake are going to be showing up. Uh, I'm looking at my notes. Also, Hogwarts and Dumbledore showed up in, in Finnegan's Wake, that which I just thought was kind of interesting. I, I'm not a I'm not a Harry Potter fan. I mean, I've read it. I've seen I've seen the movies, but I don't really think much of it. But anyways, I'm not gonna. I shouldn't I shouldn't mention that because I know I don't, I don't need to be attacked by any Harry Harry Potter fans. Um, so the tone of each letters can really vary. I, I notice sometimes they'll be very jovial and friendly when it's like his close friends or even the ones in Denora, his wife or later his wife, that they're very, um, those feel like the closest letters. And then some of the, sometimes they're very formal and very, uh, where he has to be very formal depending on who he's writing to or he's dealing with business or whatever. And there's clearly people that he likes and respects, like Harriet Shaw Weaver, but he he certainly has a more formal tone with her. Uh, sometimes, though, it seems like the, the the more he talks with her, he seems to loosen up a little. Same with William Butler Yeats. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating to see how he uses each of these voices, though. I think this is something similar to what he does in Ulysses and other books where he changes his voice. That's That's something he's really known for it's almost like pastiches or when he writes to his aunt or his brother and so on all these different uh levels of registers and f- formality there's also a lot of repetition in the letters that you don't get in his prose because you know if you're writing to different people they don't they're not reading the other letters and it's almost like he's he writes them as quickly as possible which is interesting too because He's not revising them. He's just going along with them. Sometimes he narrates them when he's having a lot of eye difficulties. And it's almost like he's doing stand-up comedy routines or he's on tour and he's trying out different material on different crowds. And there's one sequence of letters where he's describing a lot of the same information. And he uses this word magnolias, which I'd never heard. I, I had to look it up. But yeah. So... I don't think anyone's here yet. Oh, people are here. The Almighty Ohm. 
yeah, you're talking about the Greek. I'm going to mention, the, I'm going to look in this letter that I'll, in a minute or in a few minutes about where he talks about his Greek ability. And it's interesting because if you remember in Ulysses in Telemachus, the opening episode, uh, Buck Mulligan says that he speaks Greek and he said, he's talking to Stephen Dedalus and he's saying like, oh, you got to learn Greek. It's such amazing language. And I think they, uh, there's parts in Finnegan's Wake where he quotes Aristophanes, the birds, and so on. So, uh, yeah, we'll look at that. Uh, Almighty Ohm, you're saying, it's interesting, it says there's no viewers here right now, but clearly you're commenting and viewing. I don't know how you're able to ghost your way into the, the chat without showing up on YouTube's, uh, maybe it's just YouTube's problem. But anyways, glad you're here. Uh, I like Schopenhauer when he said that learning another language allows one to separate the ideas from language. Oh, I, I don't think I've heard that quote. Schopenhauer, I've not, I don't think I've read in the original. I know that I feel like Joseph Campbell at some point says that Schopenhauer is his favorite philosopher, but I could be wrong about that. So uh, yeah, if you have any recommendations for Schopenhauer, uh, I've been... I would probably, it's probably something that I'd like to wait until I can speak better German because my German's probably like A2 level at this point and I'm, I need to wait a while before it. But um, Almighty Ohm, you're saying, I mentioned it a few weeks back. It's obvious in his writing. You mentioned it with his own construction of compound words. Yeah, I kind of remember. It's been it's been more than a few weeks. It's been like, <laughs> it's been over a month since I've done these. So, and I can't remember anything anyways. But it, yeah, feel free to, uh, mention that again. That's a, that's a good idea because uh, I've read, I've been reading a lot in Spanish lately, and um, yeah. So anyway, hundred, hundreds of philosophers loved Shope. Shope <laughs> um, is that what they call them? The people in the know. Uh, so let me uh, dive back into my notes before I get into the letters. Okay, so um, okay, so. One thing that I was looking for in the letters was to see, because I'm I, I'm not finished with the letters. I think I'm around 1925, 26 or something. And uh, one thing I had heard, I don't remember where, was that after Joyce finished Ulysses, that he he had a kind of writer's block and that he wasn't able to to really come up with anything for like a year or two. That is not the impression I get at all from the letters. What I see is that after he finished Ulysses, uh, which he in, intended to finish in 1921, which it took longer because of whatever, a lot, a lot of the problems moving around and uh, eye difficulties and so on. So my impression is that after he finished Ulysses was that first he had to one kind of deal with all the business of finishing it, the contracts and uh, getting it published in America and other places and also just revising it because the first edition had so many typos that he had to go through it and like kind of weed through all the typos. So that just took a long time. And then also after finishing it, he had to like, uh, had a lot of eye problems and that he had to like get that taken care of. He had uh, operations. So I don't see anywhere there's no mention in the letters of him saying like, I'm struggling with things. Right. No, I don't get that at all. I get that he's busy, you know, revising Ulysses and he's taking care of his health and his living situation and so on. Uh, but nowhere, I don't see any reference to writer's block. So I don't know where, wherever I heard that, I think they're wrong. <laughs> and, um, they seem to have no trouble once he starts spinning his weight. He just seems like as soon as he has free time and is able to do it, he just, gets right into it and mm, also getting copies to re, kind of doing the marketing of Ulysses. He's sending copies to reviewers, trying to get the book out and handling the press involved with as U, Ulysses becomes more famous. He seems to be a little disgruntled that getting uh, reviews of Ulysses he sends out copies or reviews and then there's no reviews. <laughs> I think that's maybe because either people give up or, you know, it's just a, a big book that takes a while and he wanted them to maybe burn through it in a week or two and, and then get a review out, which didn't happen. So, um, 
Yeah, he's he's going on in the letters a lot about eye troubles and surgeries. Uh, but if anyone has any evidence of writer's block, if there's some, feel free to let me know about that. But I just do not see that. And it, it feels to me very much like he's just given birth to this big book, which is something that, you know, we see a lot in uh, like Oxen of the Sun and comparing an artistic creation with birth. And that afterward, he's just recovering, taking care of all that comes with after the birth. Uh, and here's, um, yeah, so I think that's all the introductory notes and we can finally start looking at the letters. I'm going to begin with March 11th, 1923. Let me make sure you guys have any comments or su who's here. It looks like now I'm showing that one person is here. Maybe, maybe that is you, Almighty Om. You say that you um, are reading Hemingway's letters for the same reason. Salinger last month is fascinating. Salinger, Salinger has letters. I didn't realize that. And I haven't read let Hemingway's letters. I'd love to at some point. I haven't read enough Hemingway. I haven't read Hemingway in a long time, but I've, I've read or audiobooked most of his books, his main books. You're saying that Joyce suffered and his art, at least he never gave up. Many will say that it is the, cre the creativity flows from the suffering. Didn't he spend a week in one page a day choosing the word? As kind of a type of block. I know he wasn't uh, the m the most rapid of writers. I know that, but and I knew that he can spend a long time. But uh, when when he was at his most fervent writing period, he would write for like supposedly twelve hours a day. He was working on Ulysses, and uh, there's one point where he says to Miss to Harry Shaw Weaver that he's he's going to turn down the volume on that and write only about six hours a day, which I think is still most more than most writers do. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, both are newer. I think, yeah, you're talking about the, the letters of Hemingway and Salinger. That'd be interesting to read Salinger's letters, I guess. I'm, I'm, I, I've read, I think I've read all of Salinger more or less. And, uh, I, I think I kind of like nine stories the most and, you know, of course, Catcher in the Rye, but, um, I don't really, I'm not as big on Salinger the way that I don't feel like the need to return to him, but maybe it'd be interesting to read his letters. I know that, well, yeah. So, um, yeah, so let's dive into these letters and see what I have to say based on my notes and so on about the letters of James Joyce. And which I, I've mentioned before, there are quite a few. I think in the print version, there's something like 3,000 pages of three volumes. So I'm going to begin, yeah, in 1923 my highlights on my Kindle. I like the Kindle a lot. The one thing I don't like about it is that it's kind of slow. It seems like it should be faster. <laughs> I don't know why it's so slow. Like it, it just takes long. I feel like I'm dealing with this really slow motion version of, of a computer. Okay. So my first, actually, no, I'm going to begin with not 1923. I'm going to begin with uh, a few quotes that kind of come earlier along, earlier on. So this first quote, he's writing to his brother Stanislaus, and this is in 1905. So this is a really early letter. I think I just singled it out because I liked it, and I thought it was kind of interesting. It really connects with what we were talking about with suffering and all the, the hassle that deals with, that's involved with just publishing his books. I think just the the process of copying out things and making copies was just such a hassle back then. It's so much easier now. So anyways, here's the quote. And I was going to try and put all these in in text, but it would have just taken forever. I have a lot and I don't I don't really want to do that. So I'm not going to so just listen up. <laughs> so here's the quote. And Joyce again 1905 writing to his brother Stanislaus. It is possible that the delusion I have with regard to my power to write, will be killed by adverse circumstances. But the delusion which will never leave me is that I am an artist by temperament. So that's the quote. So uh, I like that quote. It was, in, it was um, you know, he has that book, Steve, I mean, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So he, he clearly is identified as an artist, even though 
1905, you would still have to go on to, to teach and do other things, but he, he just identifies completely as an artist. All right, next quote. I'm going to jump ahead to, again, another, another letter to his brother Stanislaus. This one is in 19... 19... This is a long letter. I'm trying to get to the beginning. Okay, this one is 1906. So pretty early on as well. And I don't know what the quote is. Let's see. Uh... You know what? I think this actually quote was not intended. <laughs> I think I accidentally highlighted it and it is not actually a quote. So moving on. You had mentioned uh, the letters of Hemingway. That'd be interesting because Hemingway is uh, kind of famous for revising his work and trying to cut out any word that does not be is not necessary and getting things so i'm curious how his letters compare if they're a little more flippant and just kind of uh wild okay so next letter i'm in 1920 this letter is to carlo linati his friend who i think sometimes you would write to him in italian but this letter is in english and he's talking about ulysses but i think it's also applicable to Finnegan's Wake. So let me just read the quote. I think it's just applicable to how Joyce works after from Ulysses on. So here's the quote. It is also a sort of encyclopedia. My intention is to transpose the myth subspecie temporis nostri. Each adventure, that is every hour, every organ, every art being interconnected and interrelated in the structural scheme of the whole should not only condition but even create its own technique. Each adventure is, so to say, one person, although it is composed of persons, as Aquinas relates of the angelic hosts. And I wish that I knew Thomas Aquinas well enough. Oh, we're done quoting. So I wish I knew Thomas Aquinas well enough to know what he's referring to in terms of the angelic hosts uh, being composed of uh, I, I kind of feel like I intuitively understand, but I, th I think at some point I would like to read some Aquinas and really understand what he, what he's referring to, but to saying that something is composed of smaller organisms that create a larger whole, that's kind of, uh, the term, uh, uh, whole on and that concept, it's very Kabbalistic notion of, uh, the smaller parts composing a larger whole emergent, um, such an emergence of, of higher forms out of lower forms. So uh, there's, there's like some Latin in there that subspecie temporis nostri. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Under under a type, our time, our time. I don't I don't think I'm translating that right. <laughs> I'm doing my best, but I don't think I completely understand it. So anyways, though, the idea of each section having its own. <clears throat> there's a quote, and maybe I've mentioned it before, that from... Jan, Jan Swafford's book on Mozart that Mozart tried to make each work its own have its own rules have its own style its own not be constrained by what has been found in other word in other works that it, it really is its own planet all right so we're not yet talking though about in the letters about Joyce referring to Finnegan's Wake at this point we don't even know if he's even conceived Finning his wake or some other work. All right, so next quote. Let me see if you have any comments in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, Almighty Ohm, you're saying <clears throat> <clears throat> those books, the newer Salinger's, based on the surviving letters and intervie interviews, well worth the, re the read. Hemingway's is huge, 30 hours of, 30 hours of hours also newer. It is late in my neck of the woods. Have a great evening. Joyce is always with them. All right, sounds like you've signed off, but that's okay. You can 
Maybe watch this some other time. But uh, I shall persevere and go onward with the letters. <clears throat> so, where are we? Oh, so we're in this letter to Harriet Shaw Weaver. And this is from... This letter is from... He would sometimes write her quite long letters. I mean, obviously... She's providing him money, so I think he's motivated to. But this is from June 24th, 1921. So at this point, he was working on the later sections of Ulysses, trying to wrap it. And here's what he says. I'm not sure why I singled out this quote. But it is... Oh, okay. So this is the part where he's talking about languages and how Greek, what, how, what he knows of Greek. So... Here's what he says to Harriet Shaw Weaver. And the quote is, I forgot to tell you another thing. I don't even know Greek, though I am spoken of as erudite. My father wanted me to take Greek as third language, my mother German, and my friends Irish. Result, I took Italian. I spoke or used to speak modern Greek, not too badly. I speak four or five languages fluently enough and have spent a great deal of time with Greeks of all kinds, from noblemen down to onion sellers, chiefly the latter. I am superstitious about them. They bring me luck. <laughs> so that's the quote. Um, so I guess what I was kind of singling out in this is that he, um, he it's kind of unclear. He says he used to speak Greek. I used to speak modern Greek, not too badly. I'm guessing it was a very, very simple, like kind of not deep conversations, but just, you know, being able to answer people if they spoke to him in Greek, basic things. And, it, but also he says, I speak four or five languages fluently enough. <clears throat> so I think we can, we can enumerate them as uh, Latin or obviously English and then Latin, Italian, French, four or five, maybe maybe a little German. So I'm guessing those are the ones that we mentioned before. And then as we talked about, uh, I don't know, I guess maybe Norwegian. So maybe, I don't know if Norwegian is better than his German, uh, but those are the ones that I see based on what I know about Joyce. Okay, so let's move on to... I think we're getting to the parts where he is starting to talk about Finnegan's Wake. I was really looking for the first <clears throat> reference to Finnegan's Wake, which he does not refer to as Finnegan's Wake. He keeps it a secret for as long as he can, and it's going to be known as work in progress. Okay, so the next letter is to Harriet Shaw Weaver as well. And we're in October 9th, 1923. Is this our first reference? Uh, where'd my notes go? No, this is not the first reference. Uh, this is not the right note. Where's my right note? I seem to have passed it. So on March 11th, 1923 is the first reference to writing two pages, his first pages since Ulysses. So it's been like a year and he's been writing letters, obviously, and he's been writing um, I'm trying to find the, the first, the actual reference. Okay, I think I found it. Oh, no, no, we're going to jump back. We're still before, before this part. So this is a letter to his brother Stanislaus, and it's from... 
1922, February 26th, 1922. At this point, the final first version of Ulysses had been published and was on the streets. And, oh, actually, no, this letter is from Stanislaus to James Joyce. And here's what Stanislaus says. He's talking about Circe, the, uh, you know, the, the episode in Night Town with written in the style of a play. And here's what Stanislaus says. I suppose Circe will stand as the most horrible thing in literature, unless you have something on your chest still worse than this agony in the kips. Isn't your art in danger of becoming a sanitary science? I wish you would write verse again. The last few things you have written are of so much finer a quality than your early verse that no one can doubt what you might do if you tried again. I should think you would need something to restore your self-respect after this last inspection of the stink pots. Everything dirty seems to have the same irresistible attraction for you that cow dung has for flies. I recognize, of course, the almost unlimited adaptability of your style. The flabby Dublin journalese with its weak effort to be witty or suitable to the morning after the night before. The only too well, and only too well, the obscene, ignorant scrawl of Penelope. But in the return of Ulysses, I don't understand the intention of the catechism. So this is something that I think we see with not just Stanislaus, but other people progressively, continuously as with the later sections of Ulysses and then much more with Finnegan's Wake that people who can kind of see Joyce's ability, but they don't understand why he doesn't kind of confine himself to these more um, orthodox forms and formats. And uh, I think that's just Joyce's way is to constantly want to push into new territory, do new things and not really care if they're satisfying to initially and, he has his own higher perspective on them that um, George Bernard Shaw is also going to critique Ulysses quite a bit. And uh, Joyce seems to feel that Shaw does actually try and buy a copy and on the, on the low and not, not, not make it known that he does. But Shaw says that he's not going to blow his money on uh, the stink pots of, of Dublin and so on. So... <clears throat> All right, next letter. This is to Harriet Shaw Weaver. And this is from 1922. November 25th, 1922. So later in the year. Has not yet really started writing Fitting His Wake. Just wrapping up things. And here's what he says. Uh, I don't remember what he says. Oh, I think this is a reference to Proust. So Joyce says, I think you ought to inquire about those quarterlies. I don't know what quarterly. He's talking about some magazine. Everything else sent me to Nice was forwarded. Strange to say, the writer whom I mentioned in my letter asking for them, Mr. Marcel Proust, died this day week. His name has often been coupled with mine. People here seem to have expected his death, but when I saw him last May, he did not look bad. He looked, in fact, ten years younger than his age. I guess I just kind of singled that, that out because I um, thought it was kind of interesting to see a reference to Proust. And kind of like Harry Potter, I've read all of, you know, Remembrance of Things Past, but I'm not a big fan. And uh, if anyone is a, a fan of Proust and wants to enlighten me why they love him, feel free to let I read it in English, but maybe... Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe I should have read it in uh, French. But I'm unlikely to read it again. <laughs> so, uh, next letter we're at is the first reference to Finnegan's Wake. And this is from... 1923, March 11th, 1923. And here's what Joyce has to say. So he says, Yesterday I wrote two pages, the first I have written since the final yes of Ulysses. Having found a pen with some difficulty, I copied them out in a large handwriting on a double sheet 
of foolscap so that I could read them. Il lupo perde il pelo, ma non il vizio, vizio, the Italians say. The wolf may lose his skin, but not his vice, or the leopard cannot change his spots. So, yeah. So the only things I wanted to mention was that obviously he's been writing. He's been writing letters. And uh, two pages, though, not that much. We don't know which. I don't know if we know which two pages. And, uh, yeah, but as soon as he could, he got back to it. And he seems to... Uh, he seems to, he, he doesn't, even though Harriet Shaw Weaver is somebody that he wants to kind of get excited about his work and keep informed, he's also very secretive about some things. Mm. So moving on, we have our next letter in... Okay, so this is July 12th, 1923. This one is to Sylvia Beach, who you may remember ran the bookstore Shakespeare & Co. and uh, published the first edition of Ulysses. So he just tells her, and again, this is June, no, July, 19, July 12th, 1923. I have also cataloged about 40 pages of notes in spite of the heat wave. So 40 pages of notes, clearly... He has developed a, a bigger plan of things at this point and is able to at least uh, put that down. Although, you know, his eyes were really bad at this point. Who knows how, how many notes 40 pages was. Maybe that's like 40 sentences for all we know. But he is clearly going forward with it and... I wish I didn't have these vast gaps of emptiness between letters. It's just that the Kindle's so friggin' slow. All right, so moving on. This next letter is also to Harriet Shaw Weaver, and we're in July 19th, 1923. And he, he says, he begins it, this part in French, and then he changes it to English. Pour, pour commencer means to begin. May I have recourse to the, your offered aid and ask you to type the enclosed two copies. I shall send you the original sheet, now quite illegible, when I have transcribed what is on the back of it. I think it would give me pleasure to see the first pages of type. I hope it is legible. I hope it as well as I could. No, I wrote it as well as I could. Um, so a lot of eye problems at this point. And that's all I had to say there. But asking for Harriet Shaw Weaver's help, that was kind of interesting. And on July 20th, he writes her again and says, may I trouble you to make three copies of this at your leisure, please. <laughs> please keep one for yourself. In moving today, I've lost one of your type sheets. Yeah, a lot of the letters to Miss Harriet Shaw Weaver are, they're okay. They, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the level of, of like, he, he doesn't joke with her very much. He's, he's very serious. And I think he's very grateful, but I, I think he can kind of sense that she's not as enthusiastic about Finnegan's Wake, at least in this early stage, in this early moment, as as she was perhaps with some of his other works. Okay, so this is the first letter in August 2nd, 1923, where he actually describes the content of what He's been writing, and he, he's just a short letter to Miss Harriet Shaw Weaver, and he said, and she said, he says to her, "Dear Miss Weaver, I send you this as promised, a piece describing the conversion of Saint Patrick 
by Ireland. You may keep, keep the other rough drafts with kindest regards, sincerely yours, James Joyce. So that's just all we know that I don't know Finnegan's Wake well enough at this point to say where that is, the the conversion of St. Patrick by Ireland, but I shall keep my eyes peeled for it. And do I have any comments in my notes? Yeah. I think I've covered basically all I wanted to say at this point. So, um, so in August, 1923, uh, August 23rd, 1923, Here's what he says to Harriet Shaw Weaver. Of course I have broken my promise and have begun drafting other parts in spite of the heat, noise, confusion, and suffocation. So again, this is uh, no sign at all, whatever, of writer's block. He, he clearly is ready and able to write as much as he can as soon as his eyes allow it. So whoever, whoever said he had writer's block, I think they were just being ridiculous. Okay, so in this letter, <laughs> which is to Harriet Shaw Weaver, he mentions Ford Maddox Ford. And so let me begin. So it starts out by saying, Dear Miss Weaver, many thanks for your letter and kind appreciation of the foursome episode. It is strange that on the day off I sent you, sent, it is strange that on the day I sent off to you a picture of an epicene. I think that's all I wanted to mention was that he just talks about uh, the four evangelists, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I believe in fitting his wake, they're going to be referred to as Mama Lujo, the first two letters of their names. So I just highlighted that because he's talking about that incident and clearly he had written it by October, 1923. And then later on, He's talking about Ford Maddox Ford, who I don't know. I don't think I've read. I'm not sure if I've read any Ford Maddox Ford, but apparently Ford Maddox Ford had this journal called the Transatlantic Review, which I've been trying to find in PDF form online and to no avail. If anyone can find that and knows where it is, feel free to link it because I would love to see the original. Um, I've, I've found like some transcriptions, but I want to actually see a PDF of how it appeared in the magazine. So, but here's what Joyce says. Mr. Hoofer, Huffer, who, which is, I guess, Ford Maddox Ford's real name. Uh, Mr. Huffer is very insistent. I should give him the Ear Earwicker episode. This is the first, I think, the first reference to, you know, H.C. Ear Earwicker. And Ford Maddox Ford really wants to publish it and get it in his journal and so on. I think Joyce's fame at this point was international. He was, by 1923, he was pretty well known. And I think he, uh, th there's this photo shoot with a bunch of famous people. I think Ford Maddox Ford, Ezra Pound. You should look for it online. It's, it's a fascinating photo. I think they were in England. And it's just funny photo, like, because they're just like all lounging around and, uh, I think it showed up in Time Magazine or the New York, New York Times or something. So, um, next letter that I highlighted was 1924, February 8th. This is to Harriet Shaw Weaver. It says, Dear Miss Weaver, I send you some new manuscript, Shem, Part 1, 7. A piece I had omitted, a page to replace one typed in a fresh batch of typescript. I hope it will reach you safely. The fresh text follows after the words Shem the penman. So clearly by this point he had elaborated those characters enough to really 
include them. And 1924 is the, when we first have the first appearances of Finnegan's Wake in the Transatlantic Journal. I don't know the circulation of that magazine. I'm guessing it wasn't a very big audience. It seems that when I've looked at the uh, the kind of the index, it, it seems very... Actually, I should mention, I did find some issues of that magazine, but they were really poorly scanned and unreadable. Okay, so this next letter is to Robert McCallman. I forget who Robert McCallman is, but here's what he says. I cannot write to Miss Weaver first because the matter is out of her hands and also because she is staying with Miss Marsden now, and I don't think she likes the tone of my last effusions, though... Larbod, to whom I read it, thinks they are the strongest pages I have written. The task I have set myself is dreadfully difficult, but I believe it can be done. Oh dear me, what sins did I commit in my last incarnation to be in this hole? And I think I highlighted this part because, one, he points out that Harry Shaw Weaver was not totally excited about his new writings, Finning His Wake, and that also, Joyce kind of, this is what I mentioned before, he, he has his plan, he has his vision, and like Dante with the, the Divine Comedy, he, ha he feels he has to, uh, you know, bring it into the world regardless of whether he could write something easier or more accessible. This is what he feels is upon him. So that's all I just wanted. Like even knowing that his benefactress, Miss Harriet Shaw Weaver, was not totally excited by it, he still feels compelled to go on with it and follow his uh, follow his bliss, as Joseph Campbell says. I don't know if it's, if, if it's really bliss for him, but his vision, anyways. Okay, so my next letter of highlight. Oh, I have a, a new comment, Lucas. Uh, yeah, I, I apologize, Lucas, if you're still on, but um, I realized that for Europe, this is pretty late. And uh, I'll try to, um, my next episode, I'll try to do it early in the morning again, and uh, which should be good for both America and Europe. Uh, but I, I apologize for doing this super late. I know that um, this is a bad time for Europe, <laughs> but, um, I just wanted to get started. I, I realized too, this probably isn't going to be the most exciting episode, but, um, I just wanted to get started with this again. And, uh, yeah, so this next letter is from March 7th, 1924 to Harriet Shaw Weaver. Dear Miss, and I notice a lot of these letters to Harriet Shaw Weaver. I don't know if that's because she was just becoming his, his main correspondent or if it's just cause she kept, you know, the letters <laughs> and maybe like a lot of other people just threw them away. I don't know. We just have a very good record of, of her, his letters to her. And this letter though, March 7th, 1924, Joyce says, dear Miss Weaver, I have finished the Anna Livia piece. Here it is. After it, I have hardly enough energy to hold the pen. And as a result of work, worry, bad light, general circumstances in the rest, a few words to explain. It is a chattering dialogue across the river by two washerwomen who as night falls become a tree and a stone. The river is named Anna Liffey. Some of the words at the beginning are hybrid Danish English. Dublin is a city founded by Vikings. The Irish name is Balatha Cliat. Balikli equals town of Ford of Hurdles. Her Pandora's box contains the ills fleshes heir to. The stream is quite brown, rich in salmon, very devious, shallow. The splitting up towards the end, seven dams, is the city a building. Izzy will be later Isolda. Care of Chapel Izzad. Chap Chapel Izzad. Chapel Izzad. I hope you are well and that the peace will please you. <laughs> 
So uh, this is one of the clearest descriptions that I've seen so far of the work that he's working on. I don't know if she, I don't know if it pleased her, but it was uh, <laughs> at least he's making some attempt to to clarify it, if not in the work, then you know in the letters to her. I think the Anne Olivia plurable section is one of the most widely anthologized parts of Finnegan's Wake. It shows up in like the Norton Anthology and other works. All right, so. But Joyce seems to be exhausted by the writing of it and his health, his eyes, and so on. Okay, the ne next letter is to Harriet Shaw Weaver, March 15th. 1924. I, I just highlighted this part. It should be read in successive runs. On Monday, I shall try to start Sean the Post. Uh, so I think this part about being read in successive runs is that he's talking about the order of it and the sequence of it, and that but that he's working on the Sean the Post part, which seems to have given him quite a bit of trouble. And I know at this point I haven't even done any uh, like kind of deeper summaries of the sections, but that's something I do intend to do in the future. It's just I, I feel like I need to wait until I have a better grip on it and uh, can really offer something. <laughs> I think after this episode of the Finnegan's Wake Action Hour, I'm going to kind of finish the shorter Finnegan's Wake. And then uh, I believe Lucas... Uh, recommended the uh, I, actually I don't know if he wants to be referred to as, as whatever but um, I'll say one of you recommended that uh, uh, one of the books which I have which I will read next and uh, I'll mention what book it is when I finish okay so the next letter again to Harriet Shaw Weaver he includes this code with the, the, the sigla or the, the symbols that he uses in his notes when describing the characters, which helps him write. This is March 24th, 1924. And uh, the characters that he has symbols for are Earwicker, a.k.a. H.C.E., Anne Olivia, Shem, which he, he writes shem dash Kane, Sean, Snake. I don't know what snake is. What is snake? Does anyone know? Is that a character? Oh, St. Patrick. Okay, so St. Patrick and the snake. And then Tristan, Isolde, Mama Lujo. And then there's one letter. He says, he writes an X and he says, this stands for the title, but I do not wish to say it yet until the book has written more of itself. So I, again, that secretiveness, but also describing it as until the book has written more of itself. So it's almost like he's not even the writer. It's just, it's happening this process without even him being involved, which is fascinating. If you guys know cellular automata, the, the idea, or not the idea, these, these systems that uh, you can write like a simple equation and they'll, or, or fractals, they'll, they'll kind of build themselves once you just let them go. So, so at that, this point, 1924, he clearly has most of the characters selected. And in his head, I think he has a pretty good overview of where this thing's going. Okay, next letter is April 6th, 1924. He's writing to Harriet Shaw Weaver again, and he just has this, this little quote that I thought was interesting. He says, Strangely enough, the Sean the Post piece is very amusing. To me, at least, it is extremely hard to, to write. Actually, I, I guess it shouldn't be strangely enough. I, I should have put the whole sentence, because... 
that sounds like he's saying that normally he doesn't enjoy his his own writing. But the full sentence is, um, if she has not, I have not seen her for a while. He's talking about Sylvia Beach. As my general expression is not a pleasant one to offer to anybody's gaze. Though, strangely enough, the Sean the Post piece is very amusing to me at least. Okay. So I think there's a sense of delight about the work. That's that's clear. Even as Joyce undergoes, I think like three eye surgeries, and they all sound very horrible and unpleasant, but um, he still is maintaining some sense of joy. Moving on to the next one. Oh, this one. You know what? I think I missed uh, this, this, these letters. So I'm going to jump back to 1923, uh, October 9th. Um, he's writing to Miss Harriet Shaw Weaver. He says, Dear Miss Weaver, I sent those four fellows out of the house yesterday. And when they came back, when they come back from the vast, I shall send them on. They come back from the vast. That's, <laughs> that's a very strange expression. Today I send you the rough sheets with a plan of the verse and a forgotten page of HCE. But please don't read them yet. In fact, they are illegible. On Saturday, I shall send you the typed copy and the fair copy. I'm glad to get rid of them as they gave me a lot of trouble. Okay. All right, so again, we're in, I clearly missed like a entire section of letters thanks to the Kindle's horrible highlighting. Okay, so uh, this letter is to Harriet Shaw Weaver, 1923, October 9th. No, we just read that one. Uh, oh, the next part of it is the same letter, but later on. I work as much as I can because these are not fragments, but active elements and when they are more and a little older, they will begin to fuse of themselves. So I, I love that quote. I thought that was fascinating because similar to Ulysses, he has a larger plan, but uh, being able to fuse them, again, this comes back to this idea that they're almost writing themselves. And uh, kind of like a cut up William Burroughs, that the idea that you can kind of mesh things together if you if you work at them. But let me read that again. I work as much as I can because these are not fragments, but active elements. And when they are more and a little, little older, they will begin to fuse of themselves. I, lo I love that quote. I thought that was very uh, clear indication of how Joyce works in general. I can't think of any other writers. I mean, I can think of writers since, but I can't think of writers of his time that would work like that. Um, in October 17th, 1923, he's writing to Harriet Shaw Weaver. I am glad to hear that the Earwick, Earwicker absurdity did not make you worse. 
I think the weather has been atrocious. If it is as bad in London as it has been here, and if it continues, I despair even of my four evangelist episode or sketch having any effect. It is finished, but I am filing the edges off of it. The wild hunt still continues in the Paris jungle, stampede of omnibuses and trumpets of taxi elephants, etc. And he goes on about his moving difficulties or something. Uh, I, I thought that was some, uh, some very poetic parts. The, the wild hunt still continues in the Paris jungle, stampede of omnibuses and trumpets of taxi elephants. Uh, he's, you could see his uh, writing style in fitting his wake is affecting even his, his letters. He's not able to constrain it. And moving on. Okay, so we're back in the parts where I left off before. <clears throat> He's written Ann Olivia. Okay, so this part, in June 27th, 1924, yeah. So here, here's what he's saying to Harriet Shaw Weaver. There is a, <clears throat> there's a group of people who observe what they call Bloomsday, <laughs> June 16th. <clears throat> they sent me Hortensias, white and blue, died. I have to convince myself that I wrote that book. I used to be able to talk intelligently about it. If ever I try to explain to people now what I am supposed to be writing, I see stupefaction freezing them into silence. For instance, Sean, after a long, absurd, and rather incestuous Lenten lecture to Izzy, his sister, takes leave of her with a half a glance of Irish frisky from under the shag of his parallel brows. These are the words the reader will see but not those he will hear. He also all alludes to Shem as my Somhais brother. He means Siamese. So, so I think uh, it's just interesting to see Joyce try to explain and understand that he was well aware of how confusing and impenetrable uh, fitting his wake initially seemed. but also the first reference to Bloomsday and his awareness that his, uh, he had created this thing that was almost like a, a holiday. All right. Okay, so this is a fascinating letter, which I, it kind of changed my conception of, of Joyce's knowledge of Irish, the Irish language. Because I was always under the impression, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you grew, you grew up in Ireland, you, you're exposed to it a lot, but I, I was, I'm still not totally clear how much he actually can read or, or speak it. But this is from July 28th, 1924 to Valerie Larbaud. And I don't remember who Valerie Larbaud is, but anyways, he's talking about languages and he's explaining some things. As for English words of Anglo-Saxon origin, they should be rare. The Irish peasant had no need to change the word ufige into water. And though Breton, when costumed and ver visited by tourists and Breton, Breton, blessed by Rome and Caline by St. Pseudonymous and Company, is probably more picturesque. Of course, Irish as a language is far superior so I thought that was kind of interesting because I feel like I've only heard him kind of knock Irish before and this is, he seems to be praising it quite a bit. And uh, so again, I, I wonder how, was he able to read Irish? I don't know. Unclear to me. Mm. I know he does include Irish in minimal ways in both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake.
All right. So, okay. Here's a letter from Stanislaus Joyce, his brother. And this is again, not, not the happiest <laughs> learn seeing Finning his wake. I don't think he's at all delighted with it. And he just finds it kind of annoying. And this is, he, he seems to have a much more uh, conservative angle on Joyce's writing and not, not conservative politically. I mean, conservative in terms of, uh, writing in a style that's concerned that's established so this is from what year is this august 7th 1924 stanislaus who is in trieste writes you began this fooling in the hollis episode street episode in ulysses which is of course oxen of the sun and I see that Wyndham Lewis, the designer of that other piece of impudent fooling, the portrait of an Englishwoman, imitates it with heavy hoofed capering in the columns of the Daily Mail. Or perhaps a sadder supposition. It is the beginning of softening of the brain. The first installment faintly suggests the Book of the Four Masters in a kind of bitty and blunderland and a satire on the supposed matriar matriarchal system. So yeah, that's the end of the quote. I'm just, um, I thought it was kind of funny that I haven't read Wyndham Lewis. I'm curious about his style, but I just find it funny that he's implying that James Joyce maybe have a softening of the brain <laughs> rather than try to, uh, understand Finnegan's Wake. He's, he's, he wonders about Joyce's, uh, brain. <laughs> so anyways, not at all happy with thing of the wake or some parts of Ulysses. All right, this next letter is fr also from Stanislaus. Oh, it's actually the same letter. It's just a different section of it. <clears throat> as soon as my candle starts working. There we go. Seems to have locked up. I have to say, I... I I love the Kindle, but I also hate it in a lot of ways. <laughs> I feel like it's it's designed to be not as good as it could be, so they they want you to buy the next one. Okay, so again, Stanislaus Joyce, same letter, August seventh, nineteen twenty four. Here's what he says: I have the right, I think, to make this observation. As of the two, I first attempted to write out the rambling thoughts and of a person lying awake in bed, too, until he fell asleep. This in my diary, under the date of Monday, the July 18th, 1904, I still have. You chucked it aside with a contemptuous phrase, the youthful Maupassant. So basically what, what uh, Stanislaus Joyce is saying, that he invented the, the stream of consciousness technique and that Joyce stole it from him. And then he also says... <clears throat> No writer so artificial as Maupassant suggested it to me. It was the description of the death of a Russian lieutenant in Tolstoy's story, Sebastopol, that gave me the idea. So he's saying that he he took the stream of consciousness idea from Tolstoy and that transmitted it to Joyce. So, sounds like a bit of bitter grapes, but who knows. Uh, could Stanislav Joyce have been a great writer? Who knows? I have yet to read. I actually have a. I have acquired a PDF or a, a ebook of uh, one of his books that I will read at some point. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting. I'm running out of tea, and I'm. Uh, I'm running out of steam. I think for this, uh, but we're almost done. I'm going to keep going to wrap up the letters that I highlighted. I smell spill water all over my face. <clears throat> I'm sure nobody made it this far into this video, so let's just keep going. Um, 
Okay, so I think this is the final letter that I highlighted. Yeah, and I'm sure I'll I'll do another video on letters as I get deeper into the letters and deeper into Finnegan's Wake. But this final letter is from Joyce to Harriet Shaw Weaver, January 27th, 1925. <clears throat> the parts I highlighted. So in one part, he's describing to her something and he says, the words expressing nightmares are from Greek, German, Irish, Japanese, Italian, my niece's childish pronunciation, and Assyrian, the star group called the Gruesome Hound. I have no idea what he's talking about there. I speak the latter language very fluently and have several nice volumes of it in the kitchen printed on jam pots. So is he saying <laughs> the latter language is, is that... Assyrian is Joyce saying that he speaks Assyrian very fluently. So again, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm reading that right. If if he is talking about Assyrian and if he's saying that he speaks it very fluently, I'm just saying I have my doubts if that if that is what he's suggesting, um, or maybe he's just being like kind of ridiculous, uh, which is probably the case that he doesn't doesn't speak it very clearly because clearly he doesn't have several nice volumes of it printed in his kitchen on jam pots. I think that's, that's, that's Joyce's, Joyce's idea of a joke. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it, wrap it up there. And that's, that's all the notes I had for the letters. So, uh, before I wrap, there's two things I've kind of discovered. One is a reference that I found. I found this book that I'd heard about a census of James Joyce, uh, which there's th three editions and the, the newest edition, the third edition, I'm going to link to. Basically what this book is, is a catalog, like an index of all the characters that the author has been able to find in Finnegan's Wake. You can download it there for free. Uh, I just put it in the chat and I'll put it in the comments or something, the info for this video. And uh, it seems like a, a useful resource. It also has at the beginning some kind of summary that I have not yet read, but I will try to read. And describe in the future and then um the other thing i found that i want to watch but i have not watched is this uh video called james joyce's women and i think it's basically this woman performs this this play and she does all these characters from james joyce's fiction james joyce's life here's the link you can watch it too maybe i'll watch it before the next episode and i think and Olivia Pluribel is one of the women. So that's the only connection I can see with being his wake. Anyways, I'm going to wrap it up, you guys. It's been a long stream that I'm sure nobody will ever watch. and uh, But I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot watching these, uh, these, um, these letters and uh, sorting this stuff out. So yeah. Uh, I will continue with my Fingen's Wake endeavors, and uh, I don't know if these videos are popular enough to keep going with, but I'm enjoying them, so hopefully next time I'll give you guys some more of a heads up. Uh, I only gave like less than a day notice for this one, and I know I said it was bad time for uh, Europe, so I'll try and do a better time and give you guys more of a heads up next time, but uh, I'll see you in future ones, hopefully. Toodaloo.